you know, I'd be sitting there just thinking, I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what we think on every production, though? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like that just goes with the territory of directing. Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley, and today on the show, we have Allison James. Allison is a writer and director from Australia. She made a really fantastic short film that got her a good amount of recognition, got her reps out in LA, and now she's working on developing her first feature film. So she's in a similar place to where I'm at right now, so I really wanted to talk to her and pick her brain about what she's been going through and how she's gotten to this point. I think for those of us that are filmmakers trying to break into that next level, it's really really helpful, both educational and incredibly encouraging to hear from like-minded filmmakers like Allison. She's also just incredibly smart and had some amazing things to say and opened my brain up to several things as well. So it's definitely a great one. But before we get into that, I did want to thank our sponsor, which today's episode is sponsored by Rode Microphones. Rode Microphones is the Australian pro audio powerhouse making incredible gear for podcasters, vloggers, filmmakers, musicians, and audio engineers. If you watch our show Film Riot on YouTube, then you know that I've been preaching Rode for years. It's pretty much all that I use with podcasting, with our films, with our show. Pretty much everything is all Rode. And this podcast was recorded on the Rodecaster Pro, the world's first fully integrated podcast production console. It's got four mic channels, eight sound pads for tricking effects and music, and you have the ability to bring in phone and Skype calls, which is incredibly useful. And of course, powerful onboard audio processing. It really is the perfect solution, whether you're just getting into podcasting or you're a seasoned pro. So jump over to filmright.com forward slash podcast, find the episode page for this episode, and I'll have links for all of that there for you to check out, including links to Allison as well, which speaking of Allison, it's time for me to shut up and get right into it. The place that I would like to start is just where I start with pretty much everyone. I just want to get to know more about you and, and how you got into this. What got you your start into this industry? Yeah, so I went to film school um, to be a drama director. And then while I, as part of my course, I um, made a short documentary. And so I ended up going into the documentary world for about 10 years. So I directed on about 50 hours of factual entertainment, different wow. types of documentaries in Australia before going back into, into drama. So it was a bit of an about way to get to where I wanted to go in the first place. But I, I was actually working on a, a television show called Outback Truckers, which is um, kind of like your ice road truckers, but um, without any ice, basically. <laughs> and, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I had done 24 episodes of that show, and that was in the, working in the field, so spending a lot of time, you know, filming trucks, filming vehicles, kind of filming action sequences for a very kind of male-skewed television show for Discovery. And I realised that I'd kind of come a long way from where I wanted to originally go and I just felt that my kind of voice was getting a little bit lost and as part of the research for a new show I came across this camel story and it just hit me so hard that I, I realized that I wanted to tell it and so I, I quit my job in directing documentary directing factual television to start writing so that was really how I kind of came to to start Judas Scholar. Gotcha. So so you started off, went to film school wanting to do narrative and then sort of got into uh, the documentary for quite some years and now have recently made your turn back into narrative then? That's right. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know what it was about documentary, but I think there were just, you know, the focus wasn't so much on you as a filmmaker. It was more about kind of the subject matter. And I, I think just being able to kind of pour myself into kind of a cause or pour myself into, into a story just felt like a more natural thing at the time because I was, you know, I was in my early 20s. Um, I didn't really have a lot of life experience and I probably didn't really have a lot to say at that point in time. Yeah. So um, it was really interesting working in documentaries and working with such different types of people. You know, I, I worked with kind of multi-million dollar entrepreneurs. I worked with people who worked on oil and gas rigs. You know, I really got to see inside worlds that I would never have been a part of if I had just gone straight into drama and writing kind of stories, you know, in fiction. That's really interesting. It's like a crash course in life, basically. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've never, I've never done the uh, the larger scale documentary um, like that, especially these documentary series. And what did you say? Fifty hours? Did you say? Yeah, some of these That's series crazy. It's a beast, you know. You, you. I think we were doing thirteen episodes within ten months, and that's wow. from having that's from having no talent lined up. That's from just having okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to deliver a series now. Go find all the stories, go film all the stories, edit them all, and narrate them. And you know, it's it was just an absolute machine. So you you're really part of a kind of show running system that's much more geared towards you know getting each story out on time and. And keeping the quality up and keeping the variety there um, rather than kind of just really focusing on something really small and getting the craft absolutely perfect. You know, I think in documentary you have to really I kind of only get one go at things. So you learn to kind of trust your instincts and just kind of learn how to cover something very quickly. But it's a very different skill set to working in drama. Yeah, that's very interesting to me as far as what is directing an episode look like then for you versus like narrative and, you know, how many camera operators do you have and, and what will, you know, coverage of a scene be? Is, is it just about here's the scene and you all go there to cover these sorts of things or is there more of a thought out storyline before time that you're directing? Yeah, so with, with Outback Truckers as an example, we would write a treatment and so basically we'd research who the truck driver was, what they had to translate sport and what the likely things or possible things that might go wrong on the trip would be. And and these are kind of the truck drivers that do the, the toughest kind of trucking in Australia. So they go to extremely remote places and in really challenging conditions. So there's a lot of opportunities for things to naturally go wrong. And, and it's the kind of show where we didn't do any setups. We didn't manufacture any, we didn't make anything up basically. Yeah. And so we'd have that as our plan. And then I would be filming inside the truck with a truck driver and so basically sitting next to a truck driver you know for days on end and then we would have a lot of gopros rigged up all over the truck um you know behind the wheels um depending on what was going on if we were doing river crossings we would have them at the front if we had something really high if we were carrying a big structure we'd rig that up and then we'd have a support vehicle that would have the main camera operator inside and so we'd be in communication over radios so if i was talking to the truck driver and he was saying okay there's this really crazy um river crossing coming up you know that might be crocodiles or something in there i'd radio the camera operator they would speed ahead get set up to get the exterior shot of us coming through the river i'd then duck down out of frame i'd be filming the truck driver kind of talking as as he's kind of shifting gears and telling us what the dangers might be and then if we're lucky enough for something to go wrong then we just we film the action unfolding that's interesting. So before time, like you said, you're kind of looking at the things that could naturally go along. You're kind of looking for your conflict points that may happen. Absolutely. And it's not just, you know, exterior things that could go wrong. It's like, what's happening at the truck driver at home? Like, is he strapped for money? You know, what can you do to make the character come to life? and put more pressure on them and then as a director inside the vehicle you're kind of interviewing them basically to kind of just seed little these little things in their heads so you know what would happen if you did get a flat tire and you know at first they'll just say oh you know I'll just change it but then it's just about okay but how much time would you lose if you had to change a flat tire and what would that mean if you didn't get to your destination on time so really kind of building everything around conflict with no, that kind of a format show is there a structure like a specific structure to these episodes that you kind of maybe a template you know like narrative you have that not everybody goes by it, but you have that idea of a three-act structure you know i think in more terms of like six but you know what i'm saying that midpoint you know the th yeah. third act turn are you thinking in those terms with these episodes well it's interesting because i think once i started moving into drama i wish that i had um spent a lot more time studying those kinds of classical storytelling rules because no we never looked at a midpoint it would all be kind of around I guess you know ad breaks so you're just looking to create say you know your setup your ending and then kind of three cliffhangers within the middle um, and you've got kind of three storylines three different trucks going at any one episode so there's a lot of intercutting and if you had a story that was you know maybe just nothing happened and you just you know a couple of little minor things happened and it wasn't that interesting you'd kind of build 
build up the other storylines to kind of um, make the episode feel really full. So h- how many ad breaks would you have within an episode? Gosh, I think it was three, two or three. I just, I can't quite remember. It was a few years ago now. At the time, I, w- I would have been able to tell you. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think it was three in each episode. So was the idea to have sort of, like you said, that set up and then end with the cliffhanger to go with the ad? Was that the general thought process like between those pieces? Yes. So always leaving the audience wanting to come back because in television, you just kind of can't let your audience relax. Basically, they have to want to really know what's what's going to happen. So every time you would go to another storyline or an ad break, you'd want it to leave the audience kind of on a, a bit of a cliffhanger and only resolve it like within the last, you know, 30 seconds or so of the actual episode. It's not like in a narrative where you kind of, you actually have your climax and then you have that little aftermath moment where everything kind of gets sorted out and you kind of see your characters return to a new normal. There's none of that stuff. It was just like, okay, now that they're there. <laughs> They've arrived. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And it's really interesting how much I could see how doing that sort of thing, like you said, that, that sort of, uh, you know, the Outback Truckers, sort of episodes filming that kind of lent itself into how you handled Judas Collar in some way, because you were dealing with animals, which I imagine was very unpredictable. That's right. Yeah, it was a really crazy story because it was so basically this film stars a cast of camels and we used eight real life camels um, as basically the actors in our film. How did you go about finding it? Like these were just (laughs) actual wild animals, I assume. So we, so we filmed this um, about a thousand miles outside of Perth, Western Australia, which is the second most isolated capital city in the world after Honolulu. It's really remote. Um, and you're, you're just trying to make it easy on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there are no camel wranglers that live in Perth. So we found a guy who owned a camel farm and his camels were part of a dairy, but they also would star in the nativity pageants at the end of the year, the, the Christmas pageants, as the, you know, the three wise men and the camels. Okay. So so they, so knew, they, were they knew the biz. <laughs> <laughs> they, that's right. They, um, they were domesticated. They um, had been around people a lot. They'd give camel rides, that kind of thing. So they were trained animals, but they'd never performed without ropes. And we didn't want to use a lot of CGI in the film. And that was, I guess, because I kind of came from this just really loving to do things practically and also just on a budget level, we just didn't think that we could make the camels look realistic or that people would have the same connection if it wasn't real. Yeah. So it was fully scripted. We storyboarded the whole film and then on set we would have our camera set up and our frame set up and we would show the camel owner what we needed to do, what kind of action we wanted for the shot and whether it was just, you know, we want the camels to walk from left to right and to stop in the middle and look behind it, say that was the the action. And then what we would do is we worked out that because the camels were so herd driven that if we took seven camels and put them in a pen and took one camel away and separated it from the herd, the camel would walk straight back to the herd. So it was a matter of us positioning ourselves in between and, you know, off camera we are kind of calling to the camel, we're shaking pellets, we're using other camels (laughs) for eye lines, you know, none of the audio was usable. (laughs) We had to do a lot of ADR because in order to get the shots, we just had to be basically, you know, shouting and, and, and also calling in between each other, communicating on the spot to try to work with whatever the camel was doing at the time. That is so interesting. And and so interesting that you had a full script, which I mean, I guess makes sense. But in my mind, I, I guess I kind of thought just the nature of it, it just kind of felt like you were capturing real life. And, you know, we're just the luckiest filmmakers of all time to capture this happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, which is, you know, a huge compliment to how you were able to uh, construct this because it, it really just felt so organic from start to finish. So I, in my mind, I almost thought that maybe there were just a bullet points or wish list, but that you had a whole script is really amazing and makes me curious 
in the end, is the final piece very close to what the script was? Or given the fact that you are dealing with animals, did you have to adjust quite a bit? Yeah. So, well, when I first came across this story, which is basically the way that we cull camels in Australia is using this device called a Judas collar, um, which is basically um, they find a camel, tranquilize it, put this collar on it. The collar is a tracking device that sends a signal to hunters that come and kill every single camel except for the one wearing this collar. And that camel then basically tries to find a new family, new herd, and it happens over and over again until some people believe that the camels become self-aware, that they realise that they're the cause of all of these camels around them being killed and they decide to walk alone for the rest of their life. So, so that was the story that I had kind of come across when I was researching this other documentary. But the script that I originally wrote had a woman who was lost in the Australian outback who comes across this Judas camel and it had, you know, a helicopter pilot, had lots of dialogue, but it was just never as good as the original story, that original idea of this tracking device called a Judas collar and, and taking the camel's perspective. Yeah. So it, it took me about three or four drafts to get to this wordless script. Um, and then after that, it was, um, yeah, just a kind of a matter of making the actions really clear so that we could then a- achieve them on set. But, and, and I guess having that documentary background, knowing that there would be moments that I could manipulate in the edits to um, clarify or to kind of, you know, connect people more to the characters. But the script is very similar to the end product. That's amazing. There are a few shots that we weren't able to get. Like I had this amazing idea for a shot where it was like camels running across a, a salt lake and all of their kind of long camel shadows and it, was, it would be a drone shot and it was going to be spectacular. And then on the day we got there and it had rained the night before and the camels just refused to get on the salt lake so um we ended up deciding to film it just alongside the salt lake and we would in our kind of vehicles film them and we ended up getting bogged (laughs) with two vehicles so the camels were a lot smarter than us (laughs) it's riddled with so much emotion that it's just conveyed so well all that i think that's the thing that i was most impressed about with the whole thing is you know there is no dialogue it is an animal so you know you're not perceiving the same facial expressions or anything like that that you would with you know humans that were more used to watching but all the emotions are conveyed so well and the whole piece is just so very emotional especially toward the end what was your thought pro- were you nervous about that when going into that was there something that you researched or did you do tests before that to really make sure you could convey what you were able to convey in the end um well we did yeah it's it's interesting because i think you know from a story perspective you know it's such a tragic story and what i think works well when you're dealing with animals is that because they can't speak we kind of speak for them in our heads we project our own kind of emotional experiences onto them yeah and so a lot of people take different things from the story and I think that's because, you know, we kind of bring our own emotional baggage, you know, each person has their own perspective when they're watching. In terms of the, the camels, we cast our camels, that like we knew that we had to find a camel who had really, you know, just a face that was easily conveyed emotion, who had big eyes, who felt really gentle and um, warm. And we also did a lot of camera tests as well because depending on what lens you used you could distort their face you know if you try to do kind of a tree of life style kind of shooting you end up with really elongated noses and you know it it ceases to kind of look like a camel so we did camera tests and we did casting and then it was just i think we got very lucky with the camel that we did cast was just amazing to work with (laughs) that's so did he ever storm off say he was going to be in his trailer (laughs) (laughs) we did have a couple of divas on set let me tell you the camels sometimes the camels just did not want to do what we wanted them to do and sometimes we had a really simple shot that just would take four hours oh wow and um you know i'd be sitting there just thinking I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what we think on every production, though? <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like that I just think... goes with the territory of directing. 
<laughs> How many days did you shoot? What was, what was the pr- production schedule like as a whole? So we spent a lot of time finding the locations because we knew without dialogue we'd have to use a lot of those exteriors to convey a bit of emotion as well. So we, we spent about six or seven days doing recce out in the bush and then we did another kind of tech recce about the same length um, with our cinematographer and then all you know, we did six days of shooting so it was a pretty small shoot considering we were dealing with camels but there were quite long distances between each location and the conditions were extremely tough like we were kind of dealing with 100 degree days um, with no shelter we had a lot of flies it was dusty it was a really tough tough shoot yeah i i I do not envy it (laughs) you could tell you all went through it to capture what you captured but it really paid off in the end i i really loved uh that short and i thought i thought you all did a a really really wonderful job and and after that i saw that you have two other short films that you've directed listed i but i i haven't seen those so those aren't public just yet yeah those i haven't put those up i mean i um so i did one straight after i basically i knew knew that to film this camel film, Judas Collar, it was going to take a budget. And I knew that I would have to prove that I could work with actors because at, at that time it had it was full of dialogue and actors. <laughs> so I did a, a short film that, had, um, that was just a performance piece. It was just two actors in an amateur theatre class. And um, it was just a really great experience to work with the drama crew for the first time, to work with actors for the first time and to really, you know, learn – I guess, a a little bit more about directing actors and performance and and how that all worked. So I I did that film and I'm really proud of it. It hasn't done a lot of festivals and I haven't put it online yet, but I probably will sometime down the track. I am really proud of it, but it's a little bit of an oddball film. And what what about your other Sentence? Yeah, so Sentence was interesting. Sentence um, we filmed in the only maximum security juvenile prison in Western Australia. Wow. And it was... Was a, a film that was part of almost like a corporate documentary series. Um, so basically, they did some research in Western Australia and they found that 90% of the kids who were in juvenile detention, which is basically prison, had a brain impairment. And that was from fetal alcohol syndrome, so where, where the parents kind of have been consuming alcohol during pregnancy or um, through kind of head trauma, so um, car accidents or, or being dropped as a baby. So what we did is create a series of documentaries to kind of explain what the different signs of a brain impairment are and, and, and how to deal with it for all the people who worked in and around kids who are affected. And to go with that, we created a short film that was without dialogue and it was about a young person person in detention with a brain impairment and it was just to show I guess the experience of what it might be like for someone who's who's dealing with this so it's similar to Judas Collar in that it's got no dialogue and but it was working with actors in a real prison and that one has been sent to all over Australia and is now a tool used in schools and all sorts of educational programs to help people recognise these difficulties. So I'm not sure how it's how it stands as a film just on its own, which is why I kind of haven't released it. And, you know, it's currently just in copyright at the moment doing the rounds in education. So that's why that one's not available online. That's amazing. And in, so that's two short films with, with no dialogue. Are you sort of drawn to that? Do you feel um, either liberated by the removal of dialogue or is there something about that form of storytelling that you're drawn to, or did it just happen to be that way? Yeah, so come to think of it, there is dialogue in sentence, but it's primarily without without dialogue. And it's I think I'm just really drawn to visual storytelling. Yeah. And I really love dialogue heavy films and plan to use lots of dialogue. But I guess in learnings I see shorts as a way to really hone in on craft. And for me it was, you know, coming from that documentary background where you maybe get one go at, at coverage and then you don't get to do it again. It was really just learning how to create shots that really communicate emotion or, or that really communicate story. Yeah. So kind of not relying on dialogue so much. And then with my short view of Blue Eyes, which is just the two-hander, that 
almost completely dialogue. And that was really to kind of just get into the world of, of performance. Yeah. And, and through this process of, you know, jumping right in feet first to narrative, which you've done fantastically, are there a few things that since, you know, it's been so recent and so fast that you've found that has really helped you or has been like, I call them for me, I call them light switches. Like every short film I do, a new light switch flips on. That's like this epiphany of, oh, that's how that works or, or that's how I can do that. Or, you know, that's the method I like to use. Like it becomes clear to me. Are there any of those for you within these that, you know, that light switch that's flipped on? Yes. I think, you know, coming from my first shot, which was just, I guess, interesting to me um, and, you know, interesting on a kind of more cerebral level, I've kind of learned that, you know, it's really important to me how an audience feels about the film. That's where my focus is now. I, yeah. I think a lot more about what an audience will be thinking and feeling because ultimately that's what we want as filmmakers. So I think while sometimes, you know, you can get caught up in thinking, oh, this would be really cool if we had this or this, I try to spend a lot of time on the script and a lot of time on the story trying to work out what will be the best way to communicate the the feeling or the emotion that I'm trying to hit. Yeah, I can I can relate to that quite a bit. I just uh I've been working on my first feature and working on the the script for that first feature and uh you know, a year into writing it and that's been a huge part of it what you're saying really like connects with me because it's it's often somebody reads something and something that seems so clear to you they're not getting at all. And then sometimes I've noticed that it's like one line of dialogue where or not even dialogue just by saying mom you know that the, oh it's her mother and now everything after makes sense yes that's it and i think that was a, a great learning from judas collar because it was a silent film essentially if you had anything that was just interesting and wasn't progressing the story it was incredibly confusing for an audience and so that's kind of taught me to be more disciplined in my writing to, to say okay is this just an interesting scene or is this actually does this have to be there um, and if it's not there the whole film won't make sense that is such an incredible way to look at that oh man that makes so much sense <laughs> that, just that idea of so what you're saying is is they're they're translating something you had no intention for them to translate and that's muddying the waters of the story you're trying to tell that's right and someone said to me recently if your film's about more than one thing it's about no thing and i just think that's so true you yeah. know if you if you're like okay well it's about this and this it just kind of means that you know people may think it's about this or they may think it's about this and and just it dilutes your film and so i think even if people take different things from what they feel the film is about i think you as the the filmmaker have to have that really solid idea of like no this is what this is about because then when you're writing or then when you're filming or editing every choice is kind of you hold that up against what you're wanting to say with it yeah that makes so much sense. Oh, man, I love that. That idea of, you know, not adding in things that you don't intend to be translated. I think that is such a great way to look at that. You've blown my mind a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to listen it's to that so portion hard, over though, and over again. <laughs> it's so hard because sometimes things are just cool and you're just like, oh, that's just such an awesome shot. You know, yeah, you really yeah. want to put it in there. Yeah. Or it was like, oh, that was so hard to get. And we've got this explosion or we've got this, you know, action bit or whatever it is. It's, it's yeah, hard. I, I definitely agree. I try to be as merciless as possible when cutting my films. Just if it doesn't absolutely need to be there, it just needs to go away. And and through that process, many many shots that I've I've really loved, or even a moment that I really loved, just had to go away. And it's just like, oh man. And when you're making short films, <laughs> there's no like special features. There's no deleted scenes, so it just goes away <laughs> forever. I you know I feel like I when we make when we make features, there's always that you could think, well, maybe it'll show up in deleted. <laughs> You know, maybe that'll make it feel a little nicer. Whereas in short films, you just, you throw it into the fireplace and watch it burn. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, you know, I think at the time when you're, when you're editing a short, you think, oh, there's no way I could take anything more out. Yeah. And then when you watch it a few years later, you're like, oh, wow, I could have taken three minutes out and it would have been a lot better. Yeah, I totally agree. I did, um, well, I got, I got two things with that. I did uh, back in, man, uh, 2009 when I first started my show Film Riot, I 
did this like uh, joke horror trailer that didn't exist, and I and it was something like eight minutes long, and I, I sent it to James Wan through MySpace at the time, and he was awesome enough to watch it. And the thing that he told me back was like, oh, the pacing is slow. You need to cut, you know, cut it down. And I tried to, and I did. And I'm like, I think I cut it down, and, and I just couldn't see what he was saying. And then a couple years later, I watched it again. And I was like, oh my god, this is so slow. <laughs> and it's like it needed to be chopped literally in half. And then even <laughs> recently, I did a short film called Ballistic, and the first cut was over 18 minutes, I believe, and it ended up being 15 and a half. But the over 18 minute cut, my editor and I was like, I, you know, I don't know what else to cut. But then we sent it around to trusted friends and whatnot, sat in the room with some people who hadn't seen it before. And you know, there's that weird, magical, mystical thing that happens when you watch your film with somebody who hasn't been a part of it yet or hasn't seen the cut yet. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're cringing and like, why did I leave that in? This is terrible. That's it. And you all of a sudden see, I don't know why that happens, but you all of a sudden see all those things. And uh, so we were able to cut three minutes out of the piece after we got notes back and watch it with a few people just finding that pacing and, and you know, chopping mercilessly. So I, I totally relate to that as well. I think it's so helpful to have people watch your film and I send it to as many people as I can during rough cut, fine cut, everything because I'd rather hear before the film's on a big screen or before it's in a festival or anything like that, you know, what to cut. And I try to ask people to be really just take no prisoners. Yeah, be brutal. <laughs> because, <laughs> that's it. But it's hard, it's, especially when you've worked really hard on it and you feel like you're really close and then people are like, oh, you can change this, this and this and this and you're like, oh, God. <laughs> I, I, always have, I always have an initial reaction of, you're wrong! <laughs> and, then, and then like five minutes later, I'm like, damn it, they're right. <laughs> Do you have a way that you've come across that grouping of people that, you know, are those trusted crew that you show things to? And I find that I kind of have like layers, people I see as mentors, people I see as peers, people uh, who I see are like an audience, not necessarily filmmakers, but people who would just watch it like an audience. So I'm getting like this sort of choir of voices. Yes. I think, um, you know, coming from a small city where there's a very small filmmaking community, one of the things that is really great about being from that kind of place is that you get to know the other filmmakers and you're feeding back on their films all of the time on their scripts and they're doing the same for you. And I think after a while, you just get to know the people that share your taste because it's really hard when you get feedback from a lot of different people and it's, you know, maybe it says a lot of different things. But I always try to look for the note beneath the note. If a number of people are suggesting different things, you know, what is it that they're not understanding yeah. that I was trying to say? Or, or, you know, is it just a matter of removing a few shots or adding something in, a, a little bit of exposition that will help it? But, yeah, trying to find those people who share your taste so that then when you, you know, because when you're in the edit and when you're in drafting a script, you just can't see the forest from the trees at, at a certain point. Yeah, And you sure. need to kind of have, have those kind of trusted people. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that as well. And, and it's interesting how sometimes a note can come back. And they give a note about something specific, but you know that that's not the problem. And eventually you find out that it's something that was surrounding that specific thing that they gave. And then you fix those things and then show it again and they don't, the note's fixed. I, I found yes. that's very interesting that it's like they know it's wrong. They sense that this is wrong. They didn't like it. And they ended up putting a pinpoint on it. So sometimes with certain people, you know, more the audience crew would be like, you know, if you have something specific, say it, but there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't like this part and I don't know why, you, you know, you don't have yes. to try to find a reason why you don't like it. If it doesn't stand out, why just let me know you don't like the section. You don't have to try to conjure what it, what you think it might be. Exactly. Cause someone explained it to me the other day. They said, you know, cause they gave me a note and I kind of instantly tried to fix it. And they said, you know what, this might might be a note where it's kind of like a sagging clothesline. It's like you can't just pull it up in the middle. You're going to have to look at the edges <laughs> and pull it really hard at the either side, you know, to make it work. That is so, so great. <laughs> I'm going to use that the next time I give notes to someone and take credit for it and just sound smart. <laughs> That's such a great note. <laughs> I know. It's a sagging clothesline. I know. Any, any note with a visual, I am in. <laughs> so so you put out Judas Collar. Uh, it's, it seems to, to me to have a, an amazing 
amazing reaction. Have you had a lot of opportunities open up through that? Or, you know, I, I know that you're repped through uh, WME. Was that pre-Judas or was that because of Judas? That was because of Judas. Um, so, yeah, we were really lucky to win the Austin Film Festival short film, Best Short Film. Yes. Congratulations and on that, by the way. Thank you. Um, and it was just a great festival to be at because it's, you know, it's a writer's festival and they just have so much that's interesting to screenwriters. So after that um, festival, some people from WMA ended up seeing the film and, yeah, I, and I signed with them, which was really exciting. So Did they see it at? the festival or they saw it afterwards because of the festival or they just found it online? So it's an interesting thing that I have found to be a common kind of thread that happens with these kind of stories, which is, so my husband's a, a filmmaker. His name's Zach Hilditch. He's directed a couple of features for Netflix. He did a, a Stephen King film called 1922 mm -hmm. and he just did a, did a film called Rattlesnake. And we were living in Santa Fe at the time and he was shooting Rattlesnake there. And his reps from WME came out to do a set visit and they'd met me a number of times. They knew that I was a documentary filmmaker in Australia. But then someone mentioned to them that I had just won Austin and they said, oh, you know, send us the film. And so Zach's manager sent them the film and they actually watched it on the drive back to the airport and called me straight away and said that they would like to sign me. And what I didn't realize is that they had already heard about this camel film so that they'd heard from other people that there was this crazy camel film and um, but just didn't know who had made it. And that was really interesting because I think while I, you know, made the connection specifically with these agents through Zach and through, you know, him being repped by them, I think – you know, before I had representation, there was this idea where, you know, these people have no idea about you and then you have to kind of get through these gatekeepers in order to access these people in order for them to see your films. Yeah. But what I realize now is, no, they're so aware of what is out there. They're tracking all the time what's being made, what's doing well at festivals, what's just online, um, what's short of the week, what's, you know, Vimeo stuff picks. So I think they're really aware of content out there. And so I think rather than focusing in on, you know, how do I get to these people? If you can just focus in on, okay, how do I make something that I'm really proud of or is going to reach an audience, um, it, they'll find you, you know. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. Um, you know, I'm working with Three Arts and some other different people and had the opportunity to talk to some different producers. And it came about exactly that way. It wasn't through a connection or anything. It was just by making stuff and putting it out there. And, you know, it was silence yeah. for most of the stuff I put out there. Just, you know, crickets everywhere. <laughs> but <laughs> a couple of the shorts I put out got some attention and a producer here or there wanted to talk to me. But it, it also just wasn't the time you know, I've come to learn it was, you know, because it was, well, what are you working on now? What do you want to do? And I was like, oh, kind of still figuring that out, you know, so it just, it wasn't the time for me yet, you know, and then I put out Ballistic and then it was all sudden, you know, contacts from a ton of different producers and then that ended up leading to managers and it's exactly what you said every one of the producers because i was always like i'm just curious how do you how did you find me and it was always <laughs> because yeah they a one was because it was an article from uh i forget which publication i think maybe first showing another one it was because of something they saw on the verge and another one it was because they have a division where interns just scour the internet for short films and that's their job. They watch short films all day long and then they pass them up to, you know, the creative executives uh, when they find one that they like. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, they are constantly hunting. So yeah, I've, I've had that exact experience of, of what you're saying. And it's very, very interesting and encouraging for anybody out there making stuff. It's just make good stuff. Like you said. Absolutely. And I think the other thing is, is that once you find, you know, representation, they want to read what you've got next. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's a lot of work to do kind of 
to have it ready to go. You know, if you have a, a feature that's written ready to go, that's amazing. Whereas if you've just done a short and, you know, you get picked up with representation and you don't have a feature, it's like, oh, okay, well, now you've got to spend however long finding a feature or hope that you can find a, a screenplay. But that's something that you can really be doing, you know, ahead of time before you have representation. Yeah, definitely. That's that. that was, and that's kind of my stress too, is like, you know, you feel like you have, at least I do, I feel like I have like, you know, a window, uh, the window's open and, and not only is it open, but I'm at a place in my career where I feel like I can actually go through it for the first time ever to, you know, feature land. And, um, we, <laughs> <laughs> we started building a pitch, you know, my, my manager is connecting me with some writers. We started building a pitch for a ballistic feature, but this is like an original sci-fi action that would be of a large budget with a first time director. So odds of that very, very slim. So it's getting a little discouraging. So then I just passed over, you know, this like 50 page scriptment, I call it, where it's like half treatment, half, you know, script. I, it's not my term. I mean, James Cameron calls his a scriptment. So that's where I got it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they really responded to that. And then I've spent the last year kind of developing that script. But even while doing that, you know, about to take it out, what you said about, you know, having other stuff has been like plaguing me is like, I need more things. I need, it can't just be this one basket of eggs but i've been like struggling kind of with i don't want to have things just to have them you know i just yes. making sure there are things that i'm excited about and stories that i want to tell is that i guess i'm you know, rattling on about that because i want to know do you kind of feel the same way or do you just have a ton of ideas already that these are things you want to do how are you going about sort of wrangling that I think I've become a, a lot more selective with which ideas that I develop and which ones I don't because I think just knowing how much work goes into it and how long you have to work on the script, the film, and then marketing the film and, and trying to get it out there afterwards, you know, you've really got to be in love with it at every stage of that. And I think to find an idea that's going to interest you at all of those levels, you know, of production, they don't come around all the time. So you can have a lot of projects, you can have a big slate, but one of them might get up that you don't really like. So I try to keep <laughs> yeah. my slate to, I try to make sure there are any projects that I really want to do because if it gets up and you don't really want to do it, that's, that would not be good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You, you wrote Judas Color and you wrote um, You Have Blue Eyes. Do you want to write your features as well or is that something you would rather sort of develop as a director with a writing team? I'm super open. I would love to find a script that's already written that I would like to direct. I find writing the absolute hardest, hardest bit of filmmaking. Totally agree. <laughs> and, you know, but to me, writing is directing, directing is writing. It's all the same thing. Yeah. But I just, I find it so difficult. And so, yeah, I would love to find a script that I, you know, felt really connected to. But I think at, at this point, because I'm still finding my voice, you know, I'm just focusing on trying to write my own feature. And I guess ha having that connection from script stage means that you know it so intimately and you're kind of already thinking about directing it when you're writing. So I'm hoping that that just makes it, I guess, something that's more, I guess, foolproof when it comes to directing. You know, sure. I think if I know the story that deeply because it's I've worked on it from the ground up, then that gives me a better chance of making something that's coming from my heart, I guess. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's developing some other projects with writers, I've found that I've been able to still maintain that because it's a develop from the ground up. But I kind of feel that what you're saying, like when I get sent scripts and I read them, it, there's that disconnect. So I imagine there would be, you'd have to take just a lot of time really, you know, sinking yourself into that story that was written by somebody else to make it your own, to be able to tell it. And I, and I find most up until now, well, still, not even up until now, still, every script that I've ever read has come across as even the ones I like is I don't feel like I have to make this. This is like, this has to be me that makes this. So I kind of pass on it. That's kind of been my barometer is it, it needs to be something that I need to tell the story, not somebody else, you know, and that's kind yeah. of the feature I'm writing now. That's what that one is. It's just like, this is my baby. No one touches but me, <laughs> you know? That's it. It's the one that you just like, 
can't let go, you know. Even if it, it reasons telling you maybe to give it up, it's the one that you just like, no, I've got to do this. <laughs> I don't care if it never gets financed. I've just got to get this written or I've got to get this up somehow. Yeah, I think that's where where you come with something personal and special, I think. Yeah. I mean, what do I know? I haven't made a feature, but that's that's what I get. That's what I think. <laughs> I know, but it, and writing a feature is so different than writing a short. You know, it's such yeah. a different process, and yeah, it's it's. I'm still just working really hard to to learn as much as I can about it. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that too. That it's just been a year of a, just a total learning process of telling that longer story because like you said short films are often just you know moments in time and such and the feature is such a different animal it's been very interesting but is that is that what's up next for you you're you're working on a script for your first feature that's right yes so um i'm writing my first feature and just looking at a, a few other projects that are a bit more collaborative but yeah my main focus is is trying to get a feature written that i could direct in the near future that would be Hopefully, what will happen next? And this is the one that you're writing alone. That's right. Yes, yes. And it's it's funny because you know I think coming from that television background, you know, there's so much momentum where you when you're working with a team, and writing drama is such a lonely kind of process. I find. Yes. (laughs) But it's you know I think it's um, you know I can't imagine writing this with a team. I guess that is the kind of interesting thing about features that is that they are kind of often just a a solo voice and that's what makes them interesting and different. Whereas when you've got TV and you've got a lot of different voices and so many different characters and it's got to sustain, you know, such a long period of time. It's so great to have all those different voices and different minds in the room. Yeah, I have found with with me, there are some stories that I could see writing with others, some that I am. But um, even some that are developed, it's like you're developing as you're the director and you have the writer. So there is more of a, you know, that sole authorship to some degree. But with like the one I'm writing now, like with what you're saying, I feel very much like that. Like it's so personal that it can't have multiple hands in it. It has to be that one singular viewpoint. Yeah. And I, I recently um, saw Meg LaFove talk at the Austin Hill Festival and she was just so great talking about just the process of really get kind of get cutting to the heart of your story. And sh- she was saying, if you don't feel like you're kind of walking through lava, <laughs> you haven't hit the right <laughs> spot yet. You know, if it's not hurting, you're not doing it right. <laughs> oh man, it hurts and it hurts. <laughs> and it gets really frustrating too, when you kind of hit a wall and you know, you hit a wall, even if you like write the scene, you know, the scene's wrong and you did it wrong and it feels wrong and it's kind of like a waiting game for me it's always just like waiting and waiting and then all of a sudden you have that eureka moment and then you break through that wall (laughs) that's a have you found like something similar to that yeah i have just in terms of the writing i just find that the more you write the better it gets and there's no kind of substitute for just persisting (laughs) yeah um and, you know, it's it's a really difficult thing, especially for, I think, if you're a writer-director and, you know, a lot of directors tend to be perfectionists and writing is something that you have to be bad at for a long time at every level of your career. I, I don't even think that once you're a master writer that you – just write the first draft and it's awesome. It's You just have to do bad drafts before you can make it better. And that's a really uncomfortable place to live in. But I just try to kind of know that it's going to get better at some stage. Yeah. I hope it does. Yeah, for me, it was like that fear of just getting out the first bad draft and then just working <laughs> on it from there. But I found like, you know, having a bad draft is a lot better than still being on page one. You know, you, editing <laughs> is a lot easier than... <laughs> Uh, crafting from from the very beginning it's a lot less daunting once you once you have that first vomit draft down going back and, and figuring it out from there is still frustrating but not quite as bad as when you first have just that blinking cursor on blank page <laughs> Someone was telling me recently about completion bias where you you feel like your script is really good because it's finished and then when you come to read it a few, a few weeks later, you realize that it's not actually that good. Yeah. And that made so much sense to me. Just, yeah. Oh, man. It's like <laughs> so blinded, blinded by the pride of actually finishing something. 
That's it. Are you working with your agents and, and um, managers as far as the script goes, as far as, you know, passing it back and forth or, dev- or are you kind of just, you know, tucking yourself away and, and getting a draft done? And do you, do you have a first draft done already? Yes, I have a first draft. I have a couple of drafts, but I feel like because it's I'm starting out as a writer, I feel like it's going to just take a lot of drafts to just kind of learn how screenwriting works, how, you know, a feature works. So I haven't, I've been kind of going back and forth with my manager. I haven't really had a draft that I'm super proud of yet that I've wanted to kind of send send out. So I'm kind of do like to tuck myself away until I've got something that at least I feel like is the film that I want to make. Because I think a lot of drafts are just about finding what the film is about. I mean, for me anyway, at the moment. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that completely, and that's that's also been my experience of uh, you know doing the script, sending it to my managers, and they just have such a wonderful sense of story that has really helped me. It's been it's felt like another film school for me because I have lived in the land of short films for so long, and like you said, it is you know the, these features are so different to write. So finding like you said what the story is about and everything, it's been just such an interesting process. Uh, h- how long ago did you start writing this feature? Well, I started writing probably about 18 months ago, okay, um, yeah. but I've had a, a child in that time. <laughs> so, <laughs> no um, big deal. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was pregnant when I filmed Judas Collar and so, um, wow. yeah, it's been a little bit stop-start in, in that kind of sense. But what I totally agree with you on is just the story excellence that exists within kind of managers and agents here in America. And I think, you know, it's just that learning curve that they go through when they've been working as an assistant and they're reading hundreds and hundreds of scripts a year. You know, that training is just incredible. That's a great point. And, you know, outside of America, I'm not sure that we're hitting that volume. Well, I don't think that we are hitting that volume of reading scripts. So that's one thing that I've been trying to do more of is just reading scripts, good, bad, ones that are up for Academy Awards and ones that are, you know, just from friends. Because I think it just takes a lot of reading as well as writing to kind of learn the different styles. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you said good and bad, because that's something that <laughs> I, I haven't talked about publicly. And, and I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about, but I actually have found a lot of use out of reading scripts that just aren't very good or from films that I personally, I mean, of course, this is all subjective, you know, it's my subjective view of what is good or or not, but films that, uh, you know, ended up not being very good and reading the scripts and kind of using it as an exercise of what I would do differently, or if this was mine, how would I, you know, go about restructuring, recrafting, taking out whatever to adjust it. I've I've found that just as useful as reading, uh, well, maybe not just as useful, but (laughs) very useful um, (laughs) along with reading really great scripts. Well, that's right, because sometimes when you're reading really great scripts, they're, you know, they've done countless drafts. Yeah. You never know really how many drafts or whether they've kind of polished after the film's been edited or this after the film's been shot. You don't really know when the script was finished. And so sometimes when you're reading a bad script, it's just an earlier draft and it's kind of better to be able to kind of say, oh, okay, what they needed to do was this, this and this, because that's probably more where I'm at in, in the drafting process is the earlier stages rather than kind of having these, you know, just beautifully crafted sentences. Yeah. Um, I'm just... I'm still stuck in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It kind of makes you feel like they can like hit the bullseye of perfection right away. <laughs> and you're like, why, right. why am I so bad? <laughs> I wish there was like a site that just was put up first drafts that there were like a yes. few like really well-known screenwriters. Like we all know you're amazing. We're not judging you. It's just, let's see your first draft so we can make us all feel better about ourselves. I would love that. <laughs> that would be so amazing. <laughs> just the first and last draft. Uh, that's I'm, I'm doing it. I'm starting the website. It's going to be first and last draft.com. 
sounds great. And first cuts, like rough cuts. Like I'd yeah. love to see a rough cut of some of my favorite films. You oh, know, that man. would just make me feel so much better. That'd be incredible. <laughs> with with like the temp audio and like <laughs> the lack of VFX and yeah, that would be I uh, incredible. Just a live a live video of the director watching the rough cut with an audience <laughs> for the first time, just head in hand. <laughs> it would just be it would just be like an a uh, two hour long uh, tears. Just tears for two hours. <laughs> At least if it was for me. That's what it would be. Two hours of tears. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which is what we could call it. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I really enjoyed talking to you and hearing about the path that you're on. And I have no doubt that we are just uh, you know, a short time away from, you know, seeing your first feature in theaters. And I I very much look forward to that. Thanks so much, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Big thank you to Allison for taking the time to chat with us about all of that. As always, you can find out more about Allison, including links to her work and a link to her short film that we talked about a lot in this episode over on filmride.com forward slash podcast. Of course, you can find me online at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Connolly. And if you did like this episode, it does help us out a lot. If you leave a review, rate it and share it with your friends. But that's it. Until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. <laughs>